Ωραία, έχουμε τη χαρά να έχουμε σήμερα το κόστο των διαλυνά. Όλοι τον ξέρουμε εδώ στο χρονατήριο και δεν ξέρω πώ είναι τα συνδεδεμένη. Είναι το γνωστό ερευνητή στον χώρο τη διαφημική έρευνα. Για πολλά χρόνια ήδη συνεργάτη του Γραφείου Διαστημική και Τεχνολογία στην Ακαδημία Αθηνών, πολυγραφότατο κτλ. Και σήμερα θα έχουμε τη χαρά να μα παρουσιάσει μια ομιλία. Είχαμε τι τελευταίε του. Θα μα κάνει ένα review, φαντάζομαι. Ναι, ναι, ναι. Τελευταίε του. Οπότε με χαρά, πώ θα σε ακούμε. Στα αγγλικά, έτσι. Ναι, ναι, ναι. Οκ, οκ. So I think I'm supposed to speak in English. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, uh, I hope you can hear me now, everybody. Okay. So um, I was told that I'm supposed to say a story. And because somebody told me that science is supposed to be a story uh, and it's supposed to be a good one. Not sure if it's going to be a good one, but this is the one I have. <laughs> and uh, this particular story starts with this. Uh, you can see that there is a very blurred image at the background. Maybe if there is someone who wants something okay. here with a Yeah. Go ahead. Let's go. Alspera. <laughs> okay. So the image on the back is uh, it's blurred and pixelized and you can hardly see what's happening there uh, because this is, you're all familiar with that. This is the way we perceive an idea. We have an abstract idea. We don't know what's happening there. So we just have a blurred image in our, in our minds and we want to sort of find a, a way to highlight everything. And uh, this particular story begins with a solar cycle and uh, the solar wind. It's not working. Okay. That's an advanced slides. <laughs> No, oh, okay, it, it does. Okay, so you know you have the solar wind there and you expect, so it's a good idea to have spacecraft to measure it. And then you say, uh, well, the solar wind expands or at some point it's gonna meet some surface like a termination shop or something, and it's gonna be very interesting. So what do we need? We need a new mission to go out there and measure everything. Because apparently there's going to be some very interesting physics there, and maybe there's a region in space where everything terminates and uh, we meet the interstellar flow or whatever. And you say, this is very interesting new physics out there. So you call your friends and you say, yes, I'm excited with this idea and we want to investigate. So your friends come in and they throw in ideas like, what if in the tail there's a croissant? And what if in the nose? Uh, there's something like a dragon or a dragon fire. So this is where you know you're getting, you're getting crazy. Uh, of course, this makes sense and it, it will make sense at some point, but uh, you know you're getting crazy. So this is the framework that you're supposed to work with. And uh, somehow when you do all these things and you call your friends with all this craziness uh, behind, you get a better image of what you initially started. Uh, so this is, but again, this is, uh, pixelized and sort of blurred and you don't really know what's happening there so the big question is how do you go from this to this one uh, and this is the story behind every uh, science idea I think so this is what I'm going to talk today I'm going to talk about uh, the science of the large gauge heliosphere and the missions that actually made it possible uh, and essentially try to describe how do you get from a blurry idea to a more bright and more detailed one uh, about the heliosphere, which is not an easy business, of course. Now I'm gonna do that uh, by first uh, uh, saying a few things about our place in the galaxy. And then I'm gonna talk about the in-situ ions from the Voyagers and the ENAs uh, from uh, Cassini. Uh, and then I'm gonna show you what happens when we combine this information. And finally, I'm just gonna talk about a little bit uh, what is the global shape and size of our uh, heliosphere. And don't worry, everything is gonna be uh, explained in, <laughs> in a little while. So this is our uh, the galaxy. This is uh, an artistic, of, of course, representation of uh, our galaxy. And this is where the sun, our sun is at the Orion spur. And uh, essentially, if we zoom in, we are at the edge of this uh, spur. And if we zoom in, we get 
uh, to the so-called uh, local interstellar cloud. And you can see that our sun is located sort of at, at its edge uh, of this uh, local interstellar cloud. And uh, there are other clouds surrounding this particular cloud that we are hosted that we know our best estimates so far have been that uh, we entered this particular cloud uh, approx approximately 60,000 years ago. Uh, this is according to this particular model, for example, from Jeffrey in 2022. And uh, we are moving in this uh, direction. And of course, the center of the galaxy is in this direction in uh, 26,000 light years, so very close. Uh, so if we zoom in, uh, we see that we are, of course, at the edge of this particular cloud, and we predict that we will ed exit this particular cloud in about 2,000 years. Rough numbers. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to show you how we uh, were able to see that. This is a model from uh, Jeffrey Linsky, a recent one. And you can see this is the local interstellar cloud. This dot is our sun and the solar system. This is where we entered about 60,000 years ago. And this is where we will exit in about 2,000 or 4,000 years uh, uh, ahead. Now, if we zoom in a little bit more, things get a little bit more familiar now. And uh, this is our heliosphere. And we can see that we have several missions that are, have been sent uh, throughout the years, like the Cassini mission or the Voyager ones, the New Horizons, and some past missions, like the Pioneers, that we no longer uh, are able to communicate with those. And of course, a future mission like the Interstellar Probe that I'm going to talk about uh, at the end for a, uh, briefly. So what is the heliosphere? As you all know very well, better than me actually in this particular group, uh, the sun, uh, the atmosphere of our sun is not static, but expands in the form of a magnetized fluid that we call the solar wind. So as this uh, fluid expands radially outward, uh, so the sun is here. Uh, at some point, it meets the so-called termination shock, which is a region in space where the solar wind gets compressed and gets heated. Uh, it's like entering, you know, many people trying to fit into a room from a small door, so they get compressed and uh, they get heated because the temperature uh, arises in this particular case. So this is what happens when they enter the termination shock. And then uh, we meet a bigger uh, region that we call the heliosheath, which is essentially a reservoir uh, of ions and electrons. Uh, and when I'm <clears throat> using the term reservoir, I mean uh, a region in space where uh, charged particles are quasi trapped in uh, large scale magnetic fields like in this particular case. And uh, it's bounded from the outside from the so-called heliopause. And this is where the uh, our solar wind and the solar material meets the uh, local interstellar cloud. And in front of it, uh, we think we have a bow shock or a bow wave. Actually, there was a paper in 2012 saying that there's probably no bow shock in front of the heliosphere. But then uh, a couple of years later, there was a paper from Masher and Fickner with a beautiful title said, uh, saying the return of the bow shock, uh, saying that there is a bow shock actually in front of the heliosphere, but we haven't been there. So we don't, haven't measured that. So we don't know. And we need to wait a little bit more to find out what's happening. But nevertheless, this is the region in space where the uh, galactic cosmic rays uh, originate. What happened, okay, uh, that eventually enter uh, inside the heliosphere, heliosphere and the heliosphere, and we can measure them throughout the heliosphere. So this is how the heliosphere uh, looks like. Now, let me show you a few things. And the question always is, uh, have we measured any of these uh, surfaces, plasmas, and so on and so forth? Yes, we have. Uh, thankfully, with the Voyager mission, and this is a a uh, schematic of the of the spacecraft, and you can see all these uh, yellow or orange uh, listings are the uh, actual instruments that are uh, working right now. And they're small things because they are all things. <laughs> and I'm not going to show you measurements from all these instruments, but I'm show you I'm going to show you measurements from this particular instrument that is called uh, the Low Energy Charge Particle Detector. Uh, of course, you all know the PI, this one. <laughs> Uh, our own Professor Kermitzis uh, from Historia Bo. And uh, 
The takeaway point here is that this is a detector that takes measurements of a few kV of ions and LNP, of course, of a few kV up to about 60 MeV, an integral ion measurement of a couple of hundred of MeV. And one important aspect of this particular detector is that it's mounted uh, on top of a rotating platform, which means that it can rotate uh, in time in about 192 seconds, I think, it completes one rotation, so we can take measurements of anisotropy. So this is important to keep in mind. Uh, of course, as you all know, uh, these uh, particular missions were launched in uh, 1977. So they are 46 years old. And uh, when they were uh, launched, uh, Voyager 1 was directed south of the ecliptic and Voyager 2 was directed north of the ecliptic, as you can see here, after the uh, passed through the major planets of our, of our solar system. Uh, the one went up and the other one went uh, down, but nevertheless, both of them uh, were directed toward the general direction of the uh, solar apex. So about their measurements, this is, I, I would say that this is a very, uh, that this is a historic plot because it shows the uh, ions of these particular energies from the earth all the way up to the heliopause. And I, I like showing this plot because of that. And you can see that the intensities of these ions decrease with time. And at some point, at about the year 2000, the intensities hit rock bottom. I wasn't part of the team back then. And uh, I cannot possibly imagine what it must have felt like to have nothing measured in your instrument. It could have been a little bit scary, I guess. But at some point, a few years later, the intensity started increasing again as if there was a source in front of uh, the spacecraft that we had no idea about. And of course, there was some kind of a source in front. This is where we crossed uh, Voyager 1 in uh, at the end of 2004, crossed the termination shock and entered the heliosith. And then a few years later, it crossed the heliopause and entered the very local interstellar medium. And a few years later, the same thing uh, happened, of course, uh, with uh, Voyager 2. We crossed the termination shock, went into the heliosith, and exited the heliopause uh, after about remaining uh, there for seven or nine years. And uh, all these actually happened over the course of four solar cycles, which is quite impressive. And of course, there are more measurements that I'm not showing you here, because this stops at about 2020, and we have more measurements since then. And this is the uh, a plot of the galactic cosmic rays. And you can see that there is a general increase of the galactic cosmic rays from Earth all the way up to the heliopause, uh, with, of course, an anti-correlation with respect to the solar cycle, as we all know. So this is a very informative uh, plot in my view. That's why I always like showing it. So we crossed the heliopause with Voyager 1. And once we did, and all the associated effects with this uh, inward moving termination software subsided. Then the uh, ion uh, intensity started uh, smoothing out uh, a little bit, and then they started decreasing with time. Uh, so we are in the heliosith uh, right now, and you can see there is a variation uh, of the intensities right after the crossing of the termination shock. Uh, one thing that is not shown here, but you have to take my word for me for it, is that this is Voyager one. So these are intensities of ions from Voyager one. Uh, the same intensities uh, were also shown from Voyager 2. Despite the fact, I mean, the convergence between these lines is remarkable. Despite the fact that both Voyagers were apart, approximately 170 AU astronomical units apart. So this is a very uh, important constraining factor, uh, factor for the heliosphere. And uh, of course, uh, as you probably have heard before, Voyager 1 does not have a working plasma instrument. It was damaged after, I think, uh, Jupiter's flyby. Uh, so there was no way to measure the velocities of uh, the solar wind and the plasma inside the heliosis. But because of the fact that we had the instrument rotating, as I told you, this rotating platform, we were able to measure the anisotropy and uh, infer the velocities of the plasma from the quantum getting effect. So, Somebody said something? No? So, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so 
essentially is when you're moving, when you see a flow coming to the detector, the intensities of these ions is, are getting brighter, so they increase. But when the flow uh, gets away from the detector, the intensities drop. So when you take advantage of the fact that you are able to uh, measure the incoming versus outcoming uh, uh, flow of the, uh, of the plasma, you can have an, est uh, a, an estimate of this velocity. So this is what they did, and they were able to determine this particular uh, line that you can see here where the velocities are sort of high. Actually, we're much higher than we expected beyond the termination. So this is in kilometers per second. And of course, the velocity started decreasing with time. And at some point, they even became negative right before the uh, heliopause crossing. And of course, we had a strong tangential component of the velocity that sort of became uh, nearly zero uh, uh, close, to, uh, close to the, uh, to the heliopause. So there was another surprise. Uh, of course, you are all very familiar with this <laughs> old plot, uh, schematic, I would say, uh, that has to do with the origin and uh, the creation of the anomalous cosmic rays. And you get the uh, neutral atom that comes from uh, uh, the interstellar uh, medium. And of course, it's neutral, so it doesn't govern, its motion is not governed by the magnetic field. So it can enter the heliosphere. And it, once it gets there, it can get ionized either from uh, UV or charge exchange and uh, become an ion. And then it gets picked up from the solar wind. And this is how we form the pickup ion uh, distributions in the, in the solar wind. And then it gets transported with the solar wind at the termination shock. And uh, we knew that we had this anomalous cosmic ray component of a few MeV. The question is, how do you accelerate those ions, the pickup ions to MeV energies? Because essentially the solar wind uh, can form the pickup ion distribution at about one keV. So how do you get to MeV energies? And of course, there was the whole theory about acceleration of this uh, particular uh, part of the distribution at the termination shock. And then these anomalous cosmic rays would return back to Earth and get transported uh, throughout the heliosphere. What was the theory? These are the measurements. Uh, this is the termination shock, and these are measurements from LCP. And mind you, these are, these are total energy per charge. So these are intensities over time for these particular energies for different species. And one of the things that we expected to see is this particular anomalous cosmic rays to peak at the termination shock. But I don't see any peak at the termination shock, <laughs> and I'm guessing you don't either. Uh, by contrast, what I see is that the intensities of these anomalous cosmic rays kept increasing inside the heliosphere, and the peak occurs at about, uh, let's say, a few AU beyond the termination shock, and certainly before uh, the heliopause. And of course, so this is then what we call uh, a region where the anomalous cosmic rays are further accelerated or even just accelerated there. We don't really know what's happening. There are multiple theories, but one thing is certain, there is no peak there. And then we encounter, right after this particular acceleration region ends, we encountered this stagnation region that I showed you before, uh, where the velocities drop to about uh, zero. The, this is the radial component. That I, this is the same plot that I showed you in the previous slide, only uh, turned uh, in a left to right manner. So, uh, but one of the things that was also very puzzling is the fact that we have in, uh, velocities that are below zero, radial velocities below zero. So there is an inflow at the heliopause. This is what this implies. There is some kind of an inflow. So let's move forward. And these are the actual measurements from the heliopause crossings. Uh, on top is Voyager 2, and at the bottom is Voyager 1. And uh, this particular line is the, uh, the galactic cosmic ray, so uh, a couple of hundred of MeV uh, protons. And uh, the same goes for this particular line, uh, is uh, galactic cosmic rays. And uh, the plots at the bottom in both cases is uh, essentially material from the solar wind. So you can uh, know that these are from solar origin, these are from uh, interstellar origin. And what happens is that the 
before the heliopause crossing, the intensities of the galactic cosmic rays started increasing. And of course, they peaked once we crossed the heliopause, and the intensities of the solar material started decreasing, and they decreased. This is more prominent in the Voyager 1 case. Uh, as soon as we crossed uh, the heliopause, essentially, when we crossed the heliopause, we thought that the uh, ions of these particular energies of a few MeV or KeV, uh, they dropped to background level, so we couldn't measure them. So this is how you essentially identify uh, one of the measures, one of the uh, uh, ways that you can identify the heliopause crossing. And if you want to really know when the heliopause is coming, then you should ask the electrons, which are the first, of course, to sense, or to sense that a, uh, a discontinuity is coming up because of the magnetic field, the field, they follow closely the magnetic field lines. That's the reason why. One of the prominent differences in these two uh, crossings is this one. You can see these increases at the galactic cosmic rays before the heliopause and corresponding decreases of the uh, solar material again at the same position. So what is that? Remember I told you there is a possibility of an inflow from interstellar flow to the uh, inside the heliosphere? Well, this is what it is. These are two interstellar flux tubes that are, have invaded the heliosphere from interstellar space, and they sort of served as a precursor to the heliopause. So, uh, but it didn't happen. The same thing didn't happen when we crossed uh, the heliopause with Voyager 2. So this is, uh, and of course, there is a uh, discussion of what caused this particular uh, inflow. And uh, there was a theory from Grimitz's band in uh, 2013 saying that it's most likely due to flux tube interchange instability. So you have a high magnetic flux tube uh, invading the heliosphere. Right. And yes, so these are flux tubes that are coming from the interstellar medium? Exactly. And are invading the heliosphere. And they are getting in. And they're bringing their own plasma. That's why you have this cosmic rays increasing and correspondingly. So is that, this is galactic magnetic field? Yeah. So what happens when we cross the heliopause? One of the things that we expected, of course, is that the galactic cosmic rays would be isotropic beyond the heliopause. This is what theory predicted, at least, as far as I know. But that didn't happen as well. Uh, you can see that these are measurements from uh, Voyager 1, from LCP. And these are measurements of galactic cosmic rays from a different instrument on board uh, Voyager 1 called uh, CRS. Uh, and it measures also galactic cosmic rays. And you can see that these lines, the orange ones, are galactic cosmic rays that are uh, transported perpendicular to the magnetic field. Whereas the other ones, this line, is galactic cosmic rays parallel to the magnetic field. And you can see that we have some distinct intensity dropouts at various places throughout the very local interstellar medium uh, at nearly 90 uh, degree pitch angle in this particular uh, uh, case. But it, the same thing doesn't happen with this particular galactic cosmic rays that are, are traveling uh, parallel to the magnetic field. And of course, uh, Garnett in 2015 uh, said he had a paper, he and his colleagues had a paper saying that this is a response to transient shocks and compressions from our sun. So uh, you have a shock coming from our sun that is somehow transported through the heliosphere and it gets out in the stellar sp uh, space. And we are able to pick that up uh, in uh, the measurements that we take with Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. And then we also decided to look at the lowest energies because these are very high energies. These are a couple of hundreds of MeV. And we decided to look also at low energies at our LCP instrument. And we found out that these low energies actually mirror these dropouts. These are uh, channels of low energy ions, protons, uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field. And these are parallel. You can see that the parallel component is stable, like the parallel component in the galactic cosmic rays. But the perpendicular one shows uh, depressions or decreases in the intensity in the same places as the galactic cosmic ray one. So we know that these particular uh, energies are dominated by galactic cosmic ray background in our detector. So what we can do 
Uh, we had a method, again, because of the fact that our instrument can rotate, to subtract the galactic cosmic ray background. And what we were left with was a uh, spectrum of ions that are actually coming from the heliosith and escaping to interstellar space. So hence the flux tube interchange instability because uh, this works both ways. So how do we know that? We got the spectrum from uh, these ions of this particular energies of about 40 to 139 kVs. And then we decided to compare the spectrum with uh, 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 ion measurements coming from the heliosynth. Because, of course, Voyager 1 was out. Voyager 2 was still inside the heliosynth, taking measurements. Uh, and as I said, the uh, measurements taken, taken by both Voyagers were remarc remarkably consistent. So we know that we would have had the same spectrum uh, with Voyager 1 as well. So when we compared that, we saw that, of course, the intensities are about orders of magnitude lower. Uh, but the spectral slopes are essentially the same. And of course, you should keep in mind the, here that this is not necessarily the true intensities of ions of this particular energy in interstellar space, is the intensities of ions getting out from the heliosif to interstellar space. So the intensities of the actual ions could be uh, greater. Uh, this is actually one thing that was expected by uh, Theory and Gleckler back in 1997 at a paper saying that there may be superthermal particles uh, that could play uh, a role in the pressure balance uh, at the heliopause. And voila, this is what we uh, found uh, in this case. But, <laughs> because there's always a different approach to that, this is what we think. Uh, but there's a recent paper by Fisk and Gleckler who actually took these measurements, as we saw with LCP, and they had a model saying that, you know what? Voyager, actually, the, the, they have this theory back in 2014. So they're just building this theory since then. And they said that, you know what? We never crossed the heliopause in 2012. And Voyager 1 is not now in the stellar medium. And so what happens is that they think that this is not the heliopause. This is what they call the heliocliff. Uh, it sounds funny, but it sounds, yeah, this is what they call them. And they expect the heliopause to be at about 150 AU. Of course, now we have crossed this boundary and we haven't found the heliopause. I mean, according to this particular theory, and I've discussed many times with Len uh, about this issue, uh, but, and I'm, if I must say, I'm, I think that the evidence of both points and crossing the heliopause are overwhelming, so there's no question about that. Uh, but I had to mention that there's an alternative. So who knows? <laughs> uh, there may be some truth to it. At, at least there is some uh, good in this particular model. So let me show you uh, the ENAs uh, from Inca. So the question is always, have we been able to see the heliosphere? Can you see the heliosphere? And of course, uh, the answer is no, you cannot see the heliosphere, heliosphere simply because, uh, for example, protons do not emit photons. So it's impossible to <laughs> take a picture of the, of the heliosphere. But we had a, uh, a spacecraft at Saturn, Cassini, uh, that ended, the mission ended in 2017, of course, and had many different instruments uh, and modules, uh, a very technologically advanced uh, mission, of course, and I'm going to focus in one particular uh, instrument, a suite of instruments called a magnetospheric imaging instrument, and uh, more specifically in a camera called ion and neutral camera that takes measurements uh, of VNAs and analyzes <coughs> the composition and velocity and direction of the energetic neutral atoms of a few kV, uh, 5.2 to 55 kV. And one thing to note here is that this particular camera uh, possesses, uh, possessed a high sensitivity to detect the very low intensity events uh, in the heliosphere. This is very important in this particular case because of the fact that it had a very large geometry factor, so large area that it could measure. So what are those ENAs? Uh, of course, as you know, uh, th this is Saturn. This is one of the things that I made back in my PhD, so that's <laughs> Saturn. And this is an ion. Of course, ions are governed by the magnetic field. This is the magnetic field line, so they are forced 
to spiral along the magnetic field. And this is a neutral uh, atom that is completely unaware of what's going to happen to him, to it. And one, once they get close, uh, this ion is going to steal an electron from this particular neutron, and it becomes neutralized. And then it's no longer covered by any magnetic field, and it can uh, you know, go uh, in its trajectory and meet our detector, and we can measure it. Uh, ignore what's happening. This is what's happening inside the detector, but it doesn't really matter. The point is, and the interesting fact, so is that we can think those ENAs to behave like photons, but they are not photons, and I want to stress that. Uh, and unlike photons, DNAs sort of carry the spectral and the compositional information of the parent ion distribution. Now, what does that mean? It means when you have a proton, for example, interacting with a neutral hydrogen, then you're going to get an ENA and a, and a new ion, uh, and there's not going to be any energy difference between uh, those two cases. So once you know uh, the energy of this incident ion, you know the energy of the ENA at the same time. And you always know what species created, what ion species created this particular ENA, because it's determined by this. So if you have an N, a measurement of these ions, you can sort of tell what the ENA distribution is doing as well. Sorry, yes. So uh, the momentum in the direction of the, the ion that goes yeah. became a neutron as an initial. As a yes, initial. yes. So you know that if you have a 50 kV ion creating an ENA, it's going to be a 50 kV ENA. And you know that uh, if, if you know where this ion was actually measured, then you have also the source reason. So essentially, this is a way, those ENAs is a way to probe the parent ion distribution on a global scale, as I'm going to show you later. So once we uh, do that, I'm going to stop it and move forward. And this is the point is that, oops, sorry, uh, that we can do that and take images of the whole heliosphere from inside, of course, uh, from either uh, Inca of a few kV or the Ibex of a few EV, up to a few kV. And why do that is because we can extract information on uh, the location of the dynamics of the heliosphere boundaries. Uh, we can extract information on the dynamics of the global heliosphere and its interaction with a very local interstellar uh, uh, medium. And of course, uh, discuss the shape and size of the whole heliosphere and all of the above on a global scale, which is very important. Uh, because we can have you know, millions of uh, space probes flying around the heliosphere at the same time. So this is how the heliosphere looks like in these ENAs. And these are uh, 5.2 to 13.5 kV uh, uh, ENAs. Uh, and you can see this is ecliptic coordinates. Uh, so this is the tail, this is the nose, and this is the center. Uh, by nose, I mean the place in uh, uh, the sky where the interstellar probe meets a heliosphere. And by tail, I mean the anti-nose direction, so the other direction behind the nose. And you can see that we have one, uh, this red area, these are intensities of ENAs. This red area that we call the belt with a high intensity uh, region in space that sort of encircles the sky sphere and passes through the nose and the tail and the poles. And uh, as we later identified, it's also a high pressure uh, region. And when we take the spectra of these ENAs, we identify that the spectra resemble uh, power law forming energy, so we can fit those uh, spectra with power laws. These are for different directions in the sky. This is the nose. This is the nose in the Voyager 2 direction. The anti-nose anti -nose at the tail. Uh, and this is one of the, what we call the basins, which are, are the regions in uh, space where the ENA minima occur. And when we fit them with power laws, you can see that this is a uh, distribution of the spectral index the power law. And you can see that the spectral index uh, follows the intensity changes uh, uh, of the uh, of the belt, and uh, also it becomes the, the spectra are softer uh, within the belt region and much uh, much harder uh, in the basins. And one thing that was very interesting was the fact that the tail and the nose intensities for all different latitudes and for different energies, this is 5.2 to 30.5, and this is 55 kV, are exactly the same or nearly the same. This is one of the things that we didn't expect uh, to happen. 
But of course, this is a static view of the whole heliosphere. And the question is always, is the heliosphere static? Of course it's not. And you can see these are multiple images starting from the year 2000, uh, all the way up to the year 2016. Uh, as I told you, uh, Cassini was terminated in 2017, so we had no more measurements uh, to show. But you can see that the intensities in the belt uh, focus in this particular red areas. They decrease with time. And at some point in 2012, they become minimum. And then there is a turn up in the intensities all the way up to the 2016 uh, time period, of course. There are some regions in space that we were not able to measure with uh, Inca, either due to the fact, oops, sorry, either due to the fact that uh, Inca was looking toward the sun, which is something that we, we don't want uh, because uh, the ENA, uh, our instrument would have been contaminated, of course, with sunlight and or uh, because Inca was looking at uh, the, uh, Saturn's magnetosphere. So measuring DNAs from Saturn, which again was something that we didn't want. So we had to exclude these areas. And this is why you see those black uh, pixels. But nevertheless, the point is there. The point is that we have an intensity decrease uh, over time. And then we decided to compare this decrease, this uh, transition of the ENAs over time with the actual measurements from the voyages that I showed you before. This is Voyager 1, this is Voyager 2, and the uh, yellow lines and yellow points are ENAs converted to ions in overlapping energies. So these are the same or similar energies. And the convergence is again uh, remarkable. We follow uh, the same intensity changes between ions that are measured by Inca at Saturn, ENA, sorry, by Inca at Saturn, and the ions that are measured in situ by Voyager 1 and 2 at the Heliosith. So one thing to note here is that we finally knew that these ENAs are in fact created by charge change interactions inside the Heliosith. Not before, not beyond, which is important. And the same thing happens to the tail. These are ENA intensities from the tail. We have a decrease, a very prominent decrease in the ENA intensities, a local minimum at about the year 2012, and again, an increase in the intensities uh, uh, right after, after that. And then we said, okay, what's the cause of that? Of course, it's the solar wind. And we started comparing, uh, this is the pressure and the energy flux from focus on this part of the, uh, of the plot. This is from uh, Sokol and her colleagues in 2015. Uh, from the year 2005 all the way up to the 2000, 2010. And this is the minimum, the, the decreasing phase, the declining uh, phase of solar cycle 23 that had a minimum at about the year 2010. And then an increase thereafter. And of course, you're going to say the minimum here is uh, 2010, and you're showing a minimum here at 2012 or 2013. What's the case? The problem is that, of course, nothing in nature happens instantly but it takes some time for the solar wind to go from the sun to a termination song. It's about a year with 400 kilometers per second. And then uh, the solar wind gets inside the heliosheath and it needs at least uh, one or one and a half years uh, to charge exchange and become ENA. And then those ENAs need a few months more to travel back to us at Cassini. So if you sum this up, you're gonna get about 2.5 uh, or three years uh, time delay. So that's why we have this time delay. But we know because of all this, that the inference that you get, the takeaway point from all these is that the variations in the ion and DNA intensities are in fact related to the declining phase of solar cycle 23 and the rise of solar cycle 24 as manifested in the solar wind itself. So this is the takeaway point from this slide. So what happens when we combine this information, I briefly showed you a uh, combination of all these measurements. And um, let me show you a little bit more. These are uh, spectra. This is a spectrum from uh, Cassini. So these are ENAs. And this is in situ ions from Voyager 2. Okay. So because of the fact that we have two channels in overlapping energies, the highest uh, Inca channel and the lowest uh, Voyager channel 
are overlapping energy, we know we can at least convert those ENAs to ions. And when we do that, we get this particular spectrum. This is the way we convert them. They have the ENA, uh, we have the ion spectrum. And so we convert them with this uh, equation, simplified version of it, of course, and we get this spectrum. And you can see that one of the surprises that we didn't expect was this break in the spectrum, in the ion spectrum. Now, when Voyager crossed, when Voyagers, both of them, crossed the termination shock, we realized that the uh, substantial amount of uh, the upstream energy density from the solar wind was transferred into heating pickup ions, so energies of about a few kV. And a substantial amount was also transferred to very high energies, about uh, 28 kV and beyond. Uh, this is a paper from uh, Richards on 2008. So this could be the cause of this spectral break here. Uh, and I know you're gonna say you're making a too, uh, huge fuss about this spectral break, what's so important about it. It is important because uh, one thing it happens right in the middle between those two instruments. So it's always suspicious. Is it real? Is it an instrumental effect? We don't, we couldn't know. And because of the fact that these low energies have a substantial amount of pressure that they contribute to the system compared to the higher energies, which is not insignificant. So this is pressure over energy. And you can see that this particular uh, part of the distribution covered by INCA uh, provides a substantial amount of pressure, particle pressure inside the system, so inside the heliosynth. So this is the way that we obtain the pressure. So why is this important? It is important because what happens is that most models for the heliosphere usually take a, a, you know, a kappa distribution. And don't get me wrong, I'm a kappa distribution person, I love them. But they take a kappa distribution and they fit uh, this, this kappa distribution from uh, electron volt uh, intensities, uh, energies, all the way up to MeV energies. So what happens when you do that, this is the orange line, is that you completely miss this part of the distribution. And this is important because when you calculate the pressure, you get at least an order of magnitude lower pressure at this particular energy. So it's not insignificant. That's why I'm making a huge fuss about this break and uh, what happens in this particular case. And I know some of you may complain that this is not the full spectrum and you're gonna be right about that, but uh, we actually uh, utilized all measurements from uh, the IBEX mission. So these are ENAs uh, from IBEX low and IBEX high. This is a different uh, mission that takes ENA measurements. is in orbit uh, a, a, at one AU of Earth, essentially. And these are measurements from INCA and these are in situ measurements from LCP and CRS. And so we took this spectrum in two different time periods, one over the declining phase of solar cycle 23 and one over the onset of solar cycle 24. And you can see that already the uh, ENA saw a short, you know, hardening, a softening break uh, between those two instruments at about, let's say, 1 kV. And then you have a significant softening break at the Inca energies. And of course, the ions are sort of consistent with the power law. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a possibility of a hardening break here, but you have to keep in mind, as I told you, that the uh, this particular part of the distribution did not pick at the termination shock, but unfolded as Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were progressing through the heliosphere, uh, the heliosheath. So it's not evolved uh, yet this part of the distribution. So that, that's why you don't see it here. Uh, you see a break here, but you don't see it in the uh, latter region. And of course, this break corresponds to galactic cosmic rays and it's persistent in both cases. So you, we can do the same, um, you know, exercise and convert our ENAs to ions and vice versa, of course. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I wonder if perhaps in the lower energies, if you don't have some uh, thermal because you are using power loads. Mm -hmm. so are you sure that power loads in the distribution are not some No, we are not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, talk about that point in a while, but let me briefly uh, tell you that we are not entirely sure what's happening in this particular part of the distribution. We, we know what's happening here. I mean, with uh, the ENAs from IBEX high, but there is a discussion what's happening. With oh, sorry, yes. Solar yeah, 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 right, 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 right. Sorry, no, I got no, carried no, away. Oh, through the cursor. Oh, 
Right. So I, I was talking about this particular part of the distribution. We don't really know what's happening uh, there. We assume that this is coming from the heliocene, but that might not be the case entirely. I mean, there's probably one part, uh, a fraction of this distribution that may come from uh, beyond the heliopause. So we're not entirely sure. So this break may have to do with that. So it's not entirely a power law. You're right. But it's a work in progress, I might. I have to say. Uh, so once we uh, we do that, once we convert these ENAs to ions and vice versa, we get an ion spectrum, a full ion spectrum of about uh, a few EV, 10 EV, all the way up to 344 MeV for the heliosphere. This is the first time we were able to see that. Uh, we haven't been able to measure that. And with the combination of all these, instrument missions and so on and so forth, we have been able to do that. And we did another thing. We converted the LCP uh, ion spectrum to ENAs. And one of the things that happened is that it matches the uh, ENAs from uh, Inca and they have the same power law. Despite the fact that we have this hardening break in the spectrum and the LCP energies, the power law when we co you convert them to ENAs is exactly the same, which is very important. And then we said, OK, do we have any other ENA instruments out there? Yes, we do. We have SOHO. So let's put the SOHO uh, measurements as well. And we took them. And this is where they fit, right in the prediction. And then we said, is, this gonna be, is there going to be another uh, mission with ENAs in the future? Yes, there's going to be one. This is going to be IMAP. So we predict that if IMAP is able to measure these uh, intensities, then we will know that these ENAs are in fact created inside the heliosynth. Otherwise, we know that we will need to find a different source or an alternative mechanism that creates these uh, ENAs. So there's a lot of information in this particular plot, of course, but I'm going to move forward. And one of the things that I wanted to say here is that most models in the heliosphere usually have significant trouble getting this part of the distribution right. Uh, and as I told you before, this is a critical part of the distribution. And of course, we dealt with this problem as well. And uh, so there are two ways that we decided to uh, approach this particular problem. One is to use, and I'm going to briefly go through these, uh, a regularized a set of regularized kappa distributions. So we took this ion spectrum and we said, let's use a few regularized kappa distributions in order, this is the, the function is sort of, I guess you're familiar with this particular function. Uh, and once we did that, uh, we were able to get a, a nice fit to the measurements, but this is what I'm showing you here uh, is uh, that we actually need a small factor in order to get a decent fit <laughs> to the data. And I wouldn't actually call it a fit to the data, this is more of a, um, I would say, a, you know, a solution of the, uh, this particular equation system. It's not a real fit because we used multiple kappa distributions to fit them. So anyway, there is, it proves my point that there was a uh, persistent you know, factor of about two uh, between the, the models and uh, the data that we persistently get. And uh, of course that happened in the second time period in the uh, ascending phase of solar cycle 24 and not in the first time period. The first time period was actually uh, quite good. The fit was quite good. Uh, and this happens because uh, in the uh, ascending phase of solar cycle 24, the solar cycle have, have not yet filled the entire heliosynth with ions. So we have a more disturbed uh, plasma there. And there's another explanation that we also came up with is that pickup ions and ACR shock accelerated particles need to undergo further acceleration inside the heliosynth. This is a key point. But that's not a physical model. This is just using uh, distributions to fit the data. So we decided to take a different approach. And you are very familiar, I guess, with this particular kind of uh, plots. This is from uh, Giacalone. This is 21, not 22. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so we used a uh, self consistent, uh, you know, kinetic treatment of uh, uh, protons, of solar wind protons, and uh, uh, pickup ions that form high energy tails 
of about 3 kV as far as the, the solar wind uh, is concerned and uh, of about 5 kV for the uh, pickup ions. And once you do that, then we need to plug these distributions to a global heliosphere ENA model in order to get all the distributions. And the way we do that in brief is that we need to partition the plasma energy into different parts. So we use the thermal solar wind protons and we use the pickup ions as I already said, but the pickup ions are divided into two classes. One is the ones that are adiabatically transmitted across the termination zone. So they have the energy to do that, but there are others that are being reflected at the termination shock until they reach, the, they are able to cross the, uh, to, to exceed the cross shock potential and uh, move forward. So we fit the spectra with either Maxwellians or Kappa distributions. And once you do that, then we got this particular line, which is the model. And this is how it compares with the data. Again, a factor of about two, actually this particular case, uh, the, the difference is energy dependent. So uh, the model and the data, the model spectra are softer at this particular part of the distribution and are harder in this particular part of the distribution, but they get quite good, the agreement at very high energies. So we have a problem and we don't know how to solve it. And then we decided to add another pickup ion <laughs> population uh, into the whole mix, one that gets accelerated by diffusive uh, shock acceleration, which is essentially Fermi acceleration uh, at the termination shock. And once we did that, surprise, we were able to capture this part of the distribution. Uh, so the, the lines are the model and the other, the, uh, the points are the uh, measurements. Uh, we were able to capture this part of the distribution, the spectra, but again, at high energies, you can see that there's a persi persistent discrepancy. So the takeaway point again is that even with this particular additional acceleration at the termination shock, we were able to part to partly capture uh, what's happening inside the heliosphere, not the entire energy range. So there's work that needs to be done uh, in the future. And why is this important? This is important because, and this is a very busy schematic, so don't wrap your hand around it too much. So uh, this is the solar wind, and this is just showing you how the cross termination shock, and we got to a sort of a plasma transition region that I told you before, and uh, this was intended to predict the heliopause. So we know now that we measured the heliosite thickness to be uh, about 28 AU in the Voyager 1 direction and 35 AU in the Voyager 2 direction, and there was a... Uh, multiple authors back in from 2006 to 2010 using SOHO measurements and LCP uh, trying to get the heliosite thickness. And of course, they, I wouldn't say failed, but with the knowledge we had back then, uh, the uh, numbers were way off uh, the scales in this particular case. But the breakthrough came when we actually utilized those income measurements with the LCP that I have been showing you. And that was the first person that actually did that. Uh, in 2009, as soon as the Inca data uh, came out. And uh, we were able to identify that the heliosy thickness would be about 30 to 36 AU. And then in 2011, this is from this paper, Grimitis and his colleagues were able to predict, this is a prediction of where the, of where the Voyager 1 would cross the heliopause. They missed it by a month, which is quite spectacular if you ask me. And then in 2019, we decided to do the same about Voyager 2. And uh, of course, Voyager 2 uh, crossed the heliopause a year earlier, approximately. So this cannot be a prediction. Fun fact, we actually predicted that. But I was too scared <laughs> to uh, move forward and try to publish it uh, as a prediction. Because you can see, we predicted a 35.2 AU uh, heliosite. And we got a 35.0, <laughs> uh, the actual measurement. And why was I scared? I was scared because I had to use a neutral hydrogen density that was greater than what was used by all the theorists and all the community back then. And I said, in order to get this number, this is the correct neutral hydrogen density that you need. And back then, 
the actual neutral hydrogen density was actually about 0.09 or 0.1. So I thought I must be doing something wrong. It turns out that I wasn't doing anything. But then there was multiple papers, one from uh, Svaxina in 2020, confirming that the neutral hydrogen density at the termination shock, uh, this, is, this was done with um, uh, measurements from New Horizons, should be at the order of 0 0.12 to 0 0.13. So I was wrong to be scared. Anyway, so another reason why this is important is because of the uh, pressure. This is a plot uh, showing you the pressures as a function of time uh, from Inca, LECP. This is the magnetic field, and this is the plasma instrument of Voyager 2. And you can see that the at this particular energies, uh, this part of the distribution, the 5.2 kV part of the distribution of above, plays substantial role. This is the dominant, actually, part. And what happens is that the plasma beta inside the heliosynth is, of course, always greater than unity. In fact, it's much greater than unity. Now, with the spectra that I showed you before, with all these instruments and all these different missions, we decided to also calculate the pressures. So this is a plot showing the pressures from 10 EV up to 344 MeV. And you can see that the pickup ions dominate uh, the uh, pressure inside the heliosynth, but higher energies provide a significant contribution, which we cannot neglect. So this is important to take all these measurements into account when you're trying to do a pressure balance, for example, at the heliopause. And this is one of the things that we did. We said, OK, let's use these measurements to do a pressure balance, a simple pressure balance at the heliopause to see where, whether we can actually get the measured magnetic field. And once we did that, uh, we found this number as the pressure uh, from the heliosynth, and that uh, in order to balance the uh, pressure from the magnetic field, we need an interstellar magnetic field of 0 0.68 nanoteslas. And when Voyager 2 uh, went out of the uh, heliopause, it measured the 0 0.68 nanoteslas. So it's pretty close, if you like. And the same thing was done uh, a decade before by Krimidis and his colleagues, where they had different measurements, of course, and they were able to also predict that the uh, pressure, that due to these pressures, the magnetic field upstream should be uh, set certainly above 0 0.5 nanoteslas and below 0 0.4. And it was measured to be about 0 0.5 nanotesla. So it's important to have all these measurements and take them uh, into account. So what's happened? what happens when we try to discuss uh, the global heliosphere? OK, as you all know uh, from this uh, historic uh, paper from uh, Eugene Parker in 1961, there were two competing models for the uh, global shape of the heliosphere, one that looks like a magnetosphere and one that looks like a rough bubble. Uh, of course, everybody uh, since, I don't know, a decade ago, uh, adopted this particular shape for the uh, heliosphere simply because this is what we knew from magnetospheres, and we thought, this would be the case. Uh, but this was done uh, without any data. Uh, of course, Eugene Parker, being genius, <laughs> uh, said that there may be an alternative interpretation of all these things. And uh, you could have a bubble like a um, heliosphere that uh, forms under the influence of a very large scale magnetic field that actually takes over uh, this pressure balance at the heliopause. And of course, once the Voyagers uh, went into the heliosynth and got out, we had all these measurements that I showed you before. I'm not going to go through all these numbers. But one thing that is important to keep in mind is this, is that in the upstream medium, we expected to have uh, the pressure from magnetic field compared to the uh, stagnation pressure to be at the order of 0 0.28 or 0 0.5. But the actual ratio was found to be 2. So what that means is that the magnetic field takes over and essentially dominates uh, the pressure, uh, the balance outside from the out upstream uh, uh, region. So in 2017, we came up with this uh, schematic where the, you have the heliosphere and you have the interstellar flow impinging the nose 
and is, uh, you know, uh, draped around uh, the heliosphere and the magnetic field that bulges uh, through the heliosphere and interacts directly with a very strong, uh, sorry, uh, interacts directly with uh, the heliosphere because, as I told you, this is a high beta plasma region and this is a region dominated by this magnetic field. So this is what forms the whole thing. And then we said, okay, is there any other person in the whole universe that confirms this? Uh, and there were measurements from uh, Ibex Law, uh, from uh, Galil in 2016 and 2017, who said that they couldn't understand why, but they were getting a typical thickness for the heliosheet in the downwind uh, direction of about 200, uh, 220 uh, AU. And we said in this particular paper that, of course, the heliosheet and the heliosphere is not a perfect sphere, but it could be deformed of a few hundreds of AU toward the tail end. We gave a limit of about uh, 300 AU uh, down tail. And we are at the same range here. And then there were other measurements and quite recent ones, uh, papers using IBEX data. Uh, so a different mission and different set of measurements and different energies showing that the heliotail helio extends at least at 350 AU. And then, we have models like this model uh, from galactic cosmic rays that they could actually only, uh, you know, model the transport of galactic cosmic rays only under the assumption of a bubble-like um, heliosphere, which is important. And there was also a model. Here's where the croissant comes into play. This is the croissant model that they call it. So this is the friend, <laughs> Merav Offer, that uh, put in this crazy idea of the uh, croissant uh, heliosphere that essentially the solar magnetic field drives part of the dynamics inside the heliosphere and drives two jets uh, from the heliosphere uh, down tail, but they're not strong enough to form a single comet type tail. And now this particular uh, heliosphere includes a very short tail of about 300 AU. You can see that there is a very consistent number here. Everybody gets a heliosphere of about 300 AU. So what happened to the comet type heliosphere of 2000, uh, 20,000 AU and uh, beyond? Still there. There are some uh, researchers that actually believe that their model is consistent with a long tail heliosphere of about 20,000 of AU. And surprisingly, when I asked Dan Reisenfeld, uh, if he advocates for a heliosphere of a heliosphere of 20,000 of AU, despite that, he said yes. <laughs> I was a little bit astonished, but I have to say, I have to mention that, uh, he doesn't share, so Dan doesn't share these views. It's more of this uh, view. And then I decided to look at other different, you know, measurements from Ibex High. And you can see here, they made this particular measurement uh, at, uh, you cannot really see that. This is 1.1 keV. And at 1.1 keV, they take a heliopause that goes essentially up to 20,000 EU. I don't know. They don't say. But when they use the highest energy channel of about 5 keV, close to the Inca one, they get a heliopause that closes at about, yes, 300 EU. So, this is, again, a different mission, different set of measurements, nothing to do with us. So this is uh, sort of an update that was published in uh, uh, the Cremizis 2019 paper showing uh, what we know uh, in brief about the whole heliosphere uh, and all the regions that I was able to explain to you. And we then published two review papers, actually many uh, review papers, but these are one from the perspective of uh, um, uh, measurements and one from the perspective of uh, models. So uh, I already explained, uh, I think, all of these uh, uh, little things and that drives me to the conclusions. I'm not gonna spend time to all this because I did explain it. What I wanted to say and I wanted to stress is that the phenomenology of the heliosphere can only be addressed when taking all the measurements that I just showed you into account from electron volt to MeV energies. Uh, now this part may lead to a configuration that resembles a rough bubble or a jet's croissant heliosphere or whatever. But the important point is that we cannot afford, uh, you know, 
sort of skipping measurements, either magnetic fields or uh, uh, ions and ENAs or whatever. And so we realized that back in 2018, and a group of us decided to form a uh, science center that we called the Sealed Science Center, uh, trying to you know produce a digital twin of the previous people. And uh, this is a schematic of the croissant that I just showed you before, uh, with all the major questions that we posed back then in 2018. Uh, and we started back then with this particular center um, that is located in uh, Boston and the PI is Marav Offer, of course, and John Richardson is the deputy PI. And uh, so we try to address, you know, questions like, how does the heliosphere interact with a very local interstellar medium? How do these uh, galactic cosmic rays, ACRs, and ions are transported from cradle to grave? Uh, what is the global structure of the heliosphere? And so on and so forth. And what, what we discovered when we tried to do this, um, didn't show that, is that all these models, because we employ different models, fail to get the data. We're not able to capture the data with these models. And then I remember what Richard Feynman used to say is that it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is, it doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with, merit, with the experiment, it's wrong. Simple as that. As long as the experiment is a good one. <laughs> I have to add that part, but I'm guessing this is what Richard Feynman was thinking. So it's the model's fault. No, it's not the model's fault because our models can only be as good as our measurements can be. <laughs> uh, so the Voyagers, are great missions, spectacular missions, living for 46 years. But don't forget that the measurements, the actual instruments were not built to measure these distributions that I'm showing you now. They were built to measure the distributions of Jupiter or the magnetic fields of Jupiter. For example, we have a serious problem with the resolution of the magnetic field from Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 and other instruments. So. We, have, we don't have the perfect measurements, so we cannot have the perfect models. So this is why we need, and I'm finishing, a different mission for the uh, future, and it's one that it's called the Stellar Probe, and it's uh, under study uh, from uh, NASA, and uh, it's going to be a mission that is most likely, if it moves forward, and I'm kind of hoping it will, it's going to be, uh, you know, be launched in uh, 2000. Uh, 36, and in the time frame of about 50 years, it's going to reach to the astonishing uh, distances of about 350 AU or 500 AU uh, in front of the heliosphere. So quite far, it would be humanity's first step to the interstellar space. So it's going to go beyond uh, voyagers, and it's going to have multiple, you know, uh, instruments and so on. And there has been intense. Uh, discussion. There, there was more than 30 white papers in the Decadal Survey in NASA uh, that was ended a few months ago, and there are several peer review papers that you can uh, see. But this is one of the things that we need as a community. And uh, I'm going to leave you with this. Uh, oops. We don't need the sound, so I'm going to cut the sound. Okay, it's not working. Anyway, I'm going to skip the sound. I'm going to leave you with that. Because this is the way I started. As I told you, this is, you know, drawing uh, a schematic or something. This is how this new mission uh, works. And you can see Alice Pontus and Ralph McNutt uh, drawing the schematic of this new mission and how it's going to be. Uh, it's going to travel with about 7 AU per year. That's an astonishing speed. So I'm kind of hoping that it moves forward. And I'm going to leave you with this video. Uh, and um, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk and the nice presentation. Actually, let me ask us from that point, what is the nature of the local interstellar cloud and if it does affect all what you told us today? Yeah. Do we know that? Well, we have very limited information about that because all we can do is take spectra, for example, from the Hubble Space Telescope and, uh, you know, take uh, the absorption lines and see. We don't have, for example, a direct way of measuring uh, the neutral density of the cloud. Mm. 
which is a very critical factor. Imagine I've been showing you a heliosphere all this time, assuming a neutral hydrogen density of about 0.2 particles per cubic centimeter that is assumed to be the density of our local and stellar cloud. But is it? So we don't know if it is a leftover of star formation procedure, procedure or it is a supernova thing that we yeah, yeah, there are many different scenarios about that, but it's all very important and uh, there are very few things. It would change a lot of things, measuring this uh, different okay. distributions and that. Fine. So questions first from the audience here. If there is no one, then let's check if people that are linked out. Okay, uh, yeah, yes, yes, please uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, Costa, for this really exciting talk. Thank you. Uh, now I'm coming to your slide where you showed on, on one side the DNA measurements from IBEX and from Cassini. And on the other side, there were the uh, energy spectra measured in situ by voyagers. So there is a band. And then you saw how uh, uh, these in situ measurements of energetic ions were converted to ENA. So what would be the equivalent ENAs from the ions measured to voyagers and a very nice fit. So uh, uh, my question is in converting the uh, ions to ENAs, what is between the two? Is the charge exchange cross sections, yeah. which are a function of energy? And we usually know these charge exchange cross sections from some experimental measurements, which are made just in a few energies. And then there is some interpolation and some fitting with quantum mechanics. But generally, uh, as energies get higher and higher, our knowledge of these charge exchange cross sections is 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 not highly accurate, and so how is this convolved in this, and how does it play in this band? Yeah, you are absolutely right, uh, Yanni. This is a very good point, uh, and I'm glad you asked about that. And I'm gonna generalize this point if you, if I can. So this is, I hope you can see my cursor here. Yes. Uh, so this is the the way. This is a very simplified version of how, how we uh, convert the ions to ENAs and vice versa. So this is the neutral hydrogen density. Uh, this is the charge exchange cross section that Yannis talked about, and this is the line of sight. Don't forget that all these ENAs we get with either Cassini or Ibex or whatever are an accumulation of uh, uh, reactions of charge exchange reactions through a line of sight, because this is this is what we can do. So all these factors play an, uh, an important part in this particular equation. We have been able to manage uh, to constrain some of them. For example, uh, we have these ion distribution constraint from the voyagers, and we have measured these ENA distributions from either Cassini or Ibex. So, Unfortunately, we are left with an assumption about the neutral hydrogen. So let's forget about that. For these, for the time being, I mean, <laughs> whatever, uh, for the charge exchange cross section is indeed a function of energy. So what we did is that we are using the Lindsay and Stebbings uh, 2005 cross sections that they try to, uh, you know, take all different uh, measurements throughout the years, uh, lab experiments, as you said, and they made a model uh, with some error bars uh, to make uh, the most accurate representation of these cross sections uh, for different species of a few EV up to a few EKV. Because as you said, this may be entirely different for different energies. So we are using that and we are bounded because of that to use a sort of an error bar because of this charge exchange cross section. And then that leaves us with an assumption about the source. Now, one of the things that we did is that once we established what the cross section should be based on this particular model, then we said, let's test the hypothesis 
that these DNAs are in fact created from inside the heliosheath. So there's going to be a line of sight integral of contributions from the termination shock to the heliopause. Not before that, not beyond that. So once we did that, we realized that the neutral hydrogen distribution that we needed in order to get those DNAs was this particular 0 0.12 uh, per cubic centimeter that I showed before. And then we got the verifications from other instruments on board New Horizons that measured the pickup ions so they had a line uh, trying to model this uh, kind of distribution. So it wasn't easy. <laughs> and as you said, it's a very uh, you know, detailed and very tricky process. You can easily make a mistake. Very nice result. Thank you. Okay. So let's check if there is anyone else. Okay, early. No, me neither. No. Okay. Then uh, let's thank uh, Costa again. Thanks. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for much. inviting me. And it was uh, an honor to be here. The talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's. Thank you. Oh, we are uh, closing this. No, 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 no. Oh, okay, I'm not doing it. I'm not a conversion. Stop share. Stop share. Okay. End. End for all. Okay. Uh,